Hyperloop. 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 In 1870, New York City had its first underground transit system created nearly 30 years before the subway. American inventor Alfred Eli Beach created the Beach Pneumatic Transit System. Tunneled and built in only 58 days, the Beach System carried over 400,000 passengers in its first year along a 300-foot tube near City Hall and Broadway. To the chagrin of the Democrat Tammany Hall politicians lining their pockets from the horse-drawn omnibus companies, the tunnel was actually built in secret and an opulent breath of fresh air compared to the corruption and rotting horse manure above. The stations had paintings, a fountain, even a goldfish tank, and the seats inside the pod were plushly upholstered under zircon lighting. Alfred Beach knew the city was hungry for more, but had issues getting an allowance for bonds from the Tammany-controlled governor. Because newspapers did their jobs back then and researched real corruption, that problem was solved when the new Republican governor came in and allowed funding. The real problem, however, now came to power the extension of the system. The 100 horsepower rotary motor built by the Roots Blower Company in Indiana was amazingly powerful for its time to get the pod gliding at 10 miles per hour. But this was unworkable and quite expensive for multiple motors. The project was essentially dead, but the financial panic of 1873 hammered the final nail in the coffin and funding for Alfred Beach's magic ride was not happening. Thus, the dream of pneumatic tube transportation died that year. Or so we thought. Fast forward to the year 2019, close to 150 years later and tubes have been back in the news again. The Hyperloop idea was officially introduced to the world back in 2012 by serial entrepreneur and novice 420 connoisseur Elon Musk. The infamous 58-page Alpha document in 2013 was spurred by Musk's irritation at the California High Speed Rail Authority for being slow and inefficient compared to the rest of the world, right on the first page, clear as crystal. And so far, Musk has been correct on that. The disastrous audit recently has showcased this, giving us another thing to thank California for. California. This document has spawned a plethora of Hyperloop companies and competitions which we'll get into, leading us eventually to why the Hyperloop will ultimately fail. And it isn't really engineering related. Grab a seat and sit back for this wild ride of company backstabbings, news hangings, empty cans, and even an axe. Enter Arrivo, or rather exit, as it is the first fatality of the dozen or so Hyperloop companies. Arrivo was founded by Brogan Bam Brogan, and that name is the least bizarre of this. A former engineer of Musk's SpaceX, Bam Brogan co-founded Hyperloop One with the brothers Shervin and Afshin Peshevar. Bam Brogan accused Shervin for giving a raise to a PR rep he was hooking up with, escalating to Afshin leaving a noose at Bam Brogan's desk. Fun guys to work with. Bam Brogan and some other employees staged a coup at the company, stole a few laptops, and after a lawsuit, Bam Brogan and his merry bros of Brogan started their own Hyperloop company, Arrivo. Planning to build what was essentially a regular maglev pod in Colorado, Arrivo reported getting $1 billion in funding from a Chinese firm, Genertech, which turned out to be just a line of credit. Regardless, the media ate it up. Bam Brogan's circus act continued. I mean, look at him. He's got the whip, the mustache, just give him the hat. Bam Brogan went Bam Bam Brogan in his office, apparently, stabbing holes into the wall with an axe to let up steam. With dried up funding, lack of direction, and an office makeover, Arrivo has departed in a pretty horrifying experience. This begs the question, are investors and politicians putting their transit hopes on an immature summer camp? Let's turn to the top two Hyperloop companies, Virgin Hyperloop One and Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. Virgin Hyperloop One, notice its name? Yes, the same Richard Branson that invested into the Brightline Express Rail project from Miami to Orlando is also in the Hyperloop business. In 2014, it started plainly as Hyperloop One, made by those best of buds. Since then, it's made headlines showcasing a sled on a maglev catapult hitting sand in 2016. 
putting said sled in a tube a year later to go 70 miles per hour, and to their credit, two months later, a test of a full pod going about 190 miles per hour in the 500 meter tube. This was essentially good enough to start talks and deals for building Hyperloops in between cities like Chicago to Pittsburgh, Dallas to Houston, Miami to Orlando, and in countries like India and Saudi Arabia. Their big break came when in late 2017, they announced a strategic partnership with none other than Richard Branson's Virgin Group, now amassing a total of around $300 million over separate rounds of funding. Then there's Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, or HTT. A year older than Hyperloop One, it was founded by Dirk Alborn, who crowdfunded it on his Jumpstart Fund platform, amassing close to $32 million. But since then, there's really nothing impressive compared to the previous company. Handshakes, photo ops, and pretty CGI. The only thing to show for physically includes a carbon fiber material with sensors called Vibranium. Literally trademarked. A Morgan Freeman sound-alike hyping pipes on a truck. The Hyperloop. And wait, what, what's this? An actual Hyperloop pod? Alright, guys, this is it. We're rebranding. American Hyperloop Club. I'm sure it's it's freaking awesome inside. It's gonna be So the interior of the capsule isn't finished yet. They didn't let any cameras inside. Currently it's a black tunnel. It's waiting to be designed in the next step. Alright, those are the top Hyperloop companies. But what of the man who pushed the idea, Elon Musk? What is his involvement? In these companies, nothing. In fact, Musk and SpaceX have distanced themselves from any business involvement with Hyperloops only hosting yearly competitions in LA at the SpaceX headquarters test track. This test track has had issues with depressurizing that has delayed competitions for hours, some pretty slow top speeds, and surrendering all your intellectual property to SpaceX. Credit has to be given though to the University of Munich's Work Group for Rocketry and Spaceflight, or WAR. Their latest scale model pod achieved a clean speed record of 284 miles per hour. Considering everything else so far, this has been the most impressive showing of the Hyperloop yet. Yes, the student group was able to get done in a professional manner what multi-million dollar invested Hyperloop companies have not. Points for us millennials. The main culprit for hyper hysteria isn't any of those companies however, it's the mainstream media. When they aren't fear-mongering, hating on millennials and memeing about avocado toast for the millionth time, and still seriously reporting on dossiers that could have been fabricated by 4chan, this 4chan. whenever infrastructure comes up, 9 out of 10, it's a chorus of Hyperloop. They don't even report on that well. The latest example on Elon Musk's boring company project, essentially a Tesla Model X moving through a small tunnel with rave lights, was reported as the Hyperloop by multiple sources. Look at this, even USA Today. What did the editor try to get her grandkids for Christmas? A Sony Gamebox 3DS? Out of laziness, ignorance, and a way to appease their ad revenue, the media has refused to ask tough questions on what is at this point a maglev project. Maglevs already exist. The most notable has been in service since 2004 between Pudong Airport and Shanghai that has carried millions of passengers at 270 miles per hour. Why haven't we seen a Hyperloop pod do something simple like, I don't know, take a corner? Better yet, why haven't we seen an actual pod at all? Skyway, a Russian company and despite being joked on for years, has actually made a working multimodal system and showcased a complete pod at InnoTrans 2018. During the same time, the media celebrated the empty can. It's honestly despicable. So it's up to us, the American Rail Club, to do the job that the media should be doing. Research and informing. The real reason why the Hyperloop will eventually fail is sheer economics. As a mass transit system, your main goal is to safely carry as many passengers as possible from point A to point B, while making revenue. The max capacity for a 28 passenger capsule Hyperloop system is 1,120 passengers per hour. An Airbus A320neo, the most popular narrow body for this generation, can carry about 206 people per plane. At 12 takeoffs per hour, that's about 2,470 passengers. One Japanese N700A Shinkansen can take 1,323 passengers, 
and during rush hour, the system can move more than 17,200 passengers one way. Hyperloop, even as a concept, cannot match anything that exists right now. There's a reason why China can attribute about 13% of productivity growth to its enormous bullet train network it keeps banking on, even while entertaining the Hyperloop for the time being. The next economic issue is product. Hyperloop's idea is to take rail vehicles to the next level, particularly maglev, deviating away from the air skis first envisioned by Musk. That being the case, it's already inferior technology. That's right, planet Earth, meet the Hyperloop killer, the superconducting maglev. Japan has invested over 50 years and billions of dollars that can seat over 1,000 passengers maximum per train and reaching speeds of 375 miles per hour, with more room to grow, as the 27-mile test track in Yamanashi extends to eventually connect Tokyo to Nagoya in 2027. If you can't wait till then, it will be open for the public to ride just next year for the 2020 Summer Olympics. The SC Maglev has gone faster and faster, theoretically able to reach 400, even 500 miles per hour. And if it does, the Hyperloop has zero possibility of competing with it for mass transportation. Japan isn't investing in Hyperloop, but China and rail industry companies like Talgo, Deutsche Bahn, SNCF, and even Siemens have varying levels of involvement and investment for what I theorize are two different reasons, milking the media and picking up the scraps of maglev research from the eventual hyper corpse. For investors like Richard Branson, it's most likely a diversification move. The only winning move is to play both, Hyperloop and Express Rail, coincidentally both planning Miami to Orlando with the latter already building. It's uncertain how much Virgin has invested in as both the SEC filing for Brightline hasn't been filled and they're keeping mum of what portion they are of, of Hyperloop 1's $85 million round of funding. The next failure is land acquisition. It's been seriously tough for companies like Texas Central Railway and even Brightline that already owns the land to get usage permission. You can't Robert Moses your way through farmland using trickery and state force anymore in America. Hyperloop is a different animal from high speed rail and knowing its turning radius is quite large will list not even evolved to turning yet we had to rely on simulation from a channel called MATLAB to get a good idea of what land it needs. It's a massive amount of tunneling, swooping in and out of mountains for California's alpine geography, passing over highways and vineyards, i.e. hyper expensive and leaves little room for error. That error brings us to the next eventual hyper failure, safety. In an open train, exiting out an emergency is rather simple. In an airplane, Let's hope we don't have to remember where the life vests are. In a Hyperloop, we're unsure. The most info we have is an FAQ on Hyperloop 1 that contradicts itself. In a catastrophic event, let's say thermal expansion, a tornado, or an earthquake cracks the tube, you're going to have a rushing wall of air into a system that had close to none. If the pods have emergency exits according to Hyperloop 1, and the steel is supposed to be tough enough to withstand immense pressure changes, how do you get out through the thick steel before becoming a human pancake? Passengers aren't Wolverine. And let's be serious, this deserves more than an FAQ. Safety was the number one concern for the Shinkansen, and since 1964 and 10 billion passengers later, zero have died in earthquake-prone Japan. The Hyperloop has one thing going though. You can't divide by the number of its current passengers. The last and biggest business blunder will be energy costs. Surprising, as the Hyperloop touts itself as less expensive than even rail. But like Alfred Beach, once the cart isn't in front of the horse, reality hits like a rush of air. Sustaining a near vacuum of several miles long is costly. It also takes a while to evacuate all that air. Contradicting itself again, Hyperloop 1 makes the claim that only parts of the system will require power, whilst the entire track is a linear motor for maglev operations. While existing maglev systems are reaching speeds in excess of 300 miles per hour, Hyperloop is having trouble doing just that, while now adding hundreds of vacuum pumps along the tube. It's that one trick electric companies love. And no, solar panels cannot power the entire system. There's other questions the media should be asking. Why do the pods need to be aerodynamic in a near evacuated system? 
What happened to the fans in the front? Or the air skis? Why are some of these tests still on wheels? Why should we consider inferior technology? This isn't to eviscerate the Hyperloop, but to bring the discussion back to Earth, which is why this video needs to be shared to politicians, the media, Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, and your friends. There is a place for the Hyperloop. Musk has envisioned getting humanity to Mars, and for that environment, a system like the Hyperloop makes sense. Like Alfred Beach's plan, the Hyperloop is headed for serious trouble, and it's distracting us from real solutions already out there to fix our transportation woes on this planet. We're entering an age of hydrogen-powered trains, superconductivity, even faster bullet trains, and artificial intelligence. The future is already bright. So stay on track and stay on board. ARK is having a giveaway contest and all you have to do is comment below. What's your nickname for the Hyperloop? One lucky winner will receive a free t-shirt. Be sure to subscribe and pull that bell. If you want to support ARK further, upgrade your ticket to ride by supporting us on Patreon, where just a dollar will get you access to exclusive videos and behind the scenes before the general public. Thank you for writing. Next stop, the future.